with authority. Welcome to another quarantine edition of our With Authority podcast. Uh, we've been doing these for a few months with the quarantine title in them Larry Beal, Casey Pratt, Chris Alvarez, and our special guest who is in quarantine, so to speak, lockdown, Tommy Thompson of the San Jose Earthquakes. And you're in Orlando in the MLS bubble. Uh, before we get too far, I, I could see you're in your hotel room. We, we're gonna be the ABC7 quarantine police. Is there, there's nobody else back there, is there? I wanna make sure that that room is, is secured empty, Tommy. Yeah, no, it, it's just me. There's no roommates uh, on this road trip. So it's just me here in my hotel room. Well, I know what the rules are, but now, you know, soccer players get crazy. Um, and I'm just messing with you. But uh, on a serious subject, we actually have been trying to set this, uh, this up with, uh, with the Quakes and yourself for like about a week. And then as good luck or bad luck has it, on the day we actually are recording this, we get the headline a couple hours ago that six players from the Dallas football club that they're FC, they're in the bubble. They came in negative and are now testing positive, which is, I would imagine, sending shockwaves through uh, your team and through all the teams. What was your initial reaction? And what do you know as we speak in real time here now? Yeah, so my understanding is that they were negative in Dallas uh, before the flight that they took. And then by the time that they came into Orlando, uh, two players had tested positive um, in that initial arrival uh, test that we have. That's the protocol that Major League Soccer has set up here in Orlando. And since then, um, four more players have tested positive as well. So it's disappointing. Um, you, you like to think that this tournament and this whole preparation process was going to go perfectly, but Fortunately, MLS has uh, a protocol set up to protect the teams from each other and to try to contain the virus as best as they can. Um, so they're still here, but they're in self-quarantine as well. And uh, I I'm really hoping for, for them that the virus doesn't continue to spread amongst the team. Hey, Tommy, could you maybe just take us like behind the scenes a bit because you know we hear the NBA is going to be at ESPN Wide World of Sports the MLS is there you guys were the very first team to arrive there on the scene so what is life like day to day there how just different is it so this has been our lives you know living out of a hotel room and and training um, on, on, on a soccer field and then going to a gym and training in a gym so really it doesn't feel that different I think it's a concept that's foreign to a lot of people, but as a pro soccer player, it's almost business as usual. I mean, just uh, a, a couple months ago at the beginning of our preseason, we were in Cancun and we weren't in quarantine, but the preseason process is so difficult that you don't want to leave your room anyway. So essentially you're focused on soccer the, the whole time and that's the same here. So we wake up, um, we get breakfast and then we go to the training field and our coach works us very hard. And so by the end of that, we just want to be in our hotel rooms anyway. So we just, after training, we, we rest, um, recharge the batteries. And then uh, yesterday, for example, we had a gym session at, at, at 6 p.m. So you rest up, watch some TV, get ready for that gym session. Um, and it's just business as usual. So, so we're focused on making sure we're as prepared as we possibly could be for our opening game against Seattle. And uh, that's basically what we've been up to uh, so far here in Florida. What have you heard about when the NBA arrives too? How are they handling everything with two sports leagues playing at one complex? Yeah, so there's actually all kinds of space here um, at the resort. I believe there's a number of different hotels. And even just within our own hotel, there, there's I believe six or seven teams here uh at this hotel right now and it still feels somewhat empty we haven't came across many players or uh many of the other teams at all so far i mean you see a couple of them in passing but uh it, it feels empty and so that that's a good thing so then as teams continue to come in uh the idea is hopefully that we're able to socially distance for as long as possible to keep the virus from 
um, spreading amongst the, the teams in the bubble. Tommy, when you got the word that you guys were going to be playing in the bubble, what were your initial thoughts? And what was that plane like, the plane ride like over to Florida as you guys are getting ready? I mean, everything's just so different. So kind of run me through when you found out and kind of how you guys got into Orlando. Yeah, so everyone was excited. Um, you know, the, the quarantine period was, was very difficult. I think Shay Selena said it really well after our training uh, two days ago where we had played 11 versus 11, which is a, a scrimmage. Um, and it, it had been over three months since we had played the last 11 v 11 scrimmage. And that's probably the longest period of time that we've ever gone without playing soccer. Um, as a pro soccer player, as a college soccer player, as a youth soccer player, you know, we, we don't take that much time off uh, ever. And so it, it just felt great to be back on the field and to know that everyone is, is clean and to know that uh, our team is able to tra practice with full contact. To me, it was a relief and it was exciting to just feel like everything was back to normal for the first time in, in a long time. Was the plane ride, what was that plane ride like though? That five, five hours over to Florida, was you guys, you guys were distanced. And was there nervousness quiet? Was it a normal plane ride? No, it was a, it was a normal plane ride. Um, so we were all uh, tested beforehand and we were all negative. Uh, so when we, we got on the plane, um, we were confident that we'd arrive at the hotel and test negative again, uh, which is exactly what we did. So it felt like a normal road trip. You know, it, it's actually surprising how quickly things start to feel normal again. Um, I think, I'm not sure if it's this group in particular, but there's just been a really positive energy amongst our team all throughout this process. And I think it's because we actually do enjoy being around each other. It's not just a situation with coworkers um, where you're dragging your feet the whole time. I think everyone's really happy to be back around each other and back doing what we do best. Cause there's no doubt that you know, we, we all really missed soccer throughout the quarantine period. I can't imagine after going three months without playing competitive soccer and then landing in Orlando and it's probably 90 degrees with uh, humidity of 90% and then let's go through a hard practice. What did that feel like? Especially the first few minutes where your lungs are just searing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's tough. It's tough, but that's, that's part of the job description. So it's, it's something that we had in our minds for a number of weeks prior to the plane ride to Florida and so we were sent workout plans and guys uh, go off on their own and do their own things sometimes as well, their own training programs. Um, and the bottom line is that there, there, there's no way to perfectly track every single player. So it comes down to your ability to, to hold yourself accountable. And so throughout the break, you got to make sure that you remind yourself that, hey, I know it doesn't seem like we're going to be playing um, for a while. But one day you will be playing again. So make sure you're ready because if you don't prepare for that, it's going to be really difficult. So I'm glad that um, just about everybody followed the, the workout programs really well um, because you could see e even just after the first couple of days, guys were getting acclimated and we started to feel like ourselves again on the field. I, I want to come back to the, the situation with the Dallas team and, and the testing that you guys did uh, before and after. I'm actually more encouraged by – what you know about the scenario because if you had two guys that were positive on the way in then it's understandable how other players would come in contact with the virus uh, in this case uh, you know if it was six players and we don't even know how they got the virus that would be really much more scary because okay this is understandable if, if guys came in with it okay now we've got to contain it but if it, if it was uh, just well you know, community spread, they got it from the whatever, however they got, you know, if they, if they came in negative and then suddenly tested positive a few days before you're supposed to play your first game, that's a, that's a far worse scenario. You, you understand what I'm saying with that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I'm still really optimistic about uh, this tournament and, and what we'll be doing here in Orlando, uh, because there is a protocol put in place for this situation. 
And like, like I said, they, before that flight, they had tested negative and then maybe one day had passed. And throughout that one day, um, I guess, I mean, it's difficult to spe speculate, but something must have happened where upon arrival, they then um, tested positive, which is concerning because they had just spent um, time with their teammates on the flight. Right. But I, I trust in MLS's protocol. It, it's been uh, approved by a number of medical professionals. And uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic that Dallas will, will do everything that they can to contain the virus. Yeah. How fast do you get the results back on the tests that you guys took? Is it kind of an instantaneous thing or is it one to three days? What have you got going? Uh, we've taken so many tests now that they're, they're not updating us on the results of each negative test. So I'm not sure exactly how long the process is, but I imagine um, it's, it's quick. Um, so, it, but that would be a question for one of our uh, people on the medical staff within the team, because we don't get sent our results uh, specifically. Now, I know the decision to head out there, be the first team there, had a lot to do with kind of the restrictions in Santa Clara County. But I mean, how tough was it of a sell to get you guys to go as early as you did ahead of the 4th of July weekend and potential to see friends and family? Were you guys just super excited to go or did it take a little bit of convincing? Yeah, I mean, the reality is we're, we're in a global crisis and uh, our league is in a difficult situation as well. I mean, we weren't able to provide a product for our league. We weren't able to sell tickets or, or provide TV revenue for months. And I can't speak for anyone else, but my, my, my mindset on, on the situation was that I want to get back to the field as soon as possible. That I want to help soccer to continue to, to grow in this country. Um, so I, as soon as I heard that this tournament in Orlando could be a possibility and I heard that the NBA was looking to do something similar, uh, I, I was on board. Uh, I, I was, uh, it was something that I wanted to be a part of. Of course, I wanted to make sure that it was approved by our Players Association um, and the, the medical professionals involved with us and then the medical professionals involved with the league as well. Um, and, and as soon as that got the appro approval, I, I was ready to go. Um, because like I said, I think this league has, has done an amazing, amazing job of growing soccer in America. And uh, I want to continue to contribute to that. What are some of the like amenities? Like I know that you're practicing really hard going straight back to your room, probably having to go to sleep after that. But I mean, what kind of stuff do they have set up there for entertainment aside from soccer if you guys have a day off? Yeah, I don't think we're going to be having very many days off, but they do have a pool here. Um, then there's also uh, a, a boardwalk area that you could walk around that has uh, nice views. And then our uh, team has a game room as well where there's uh, video games, there's a dartboard, uh, and there's a, a number of different things to, for guys to, to do. Um, so there's plenty of, plenty of things to do uh, if, you, if you get bored, but especially early on uh, so far on this trip, it's been so demanding physically that I haven't really thought much about, about those things. Tommy, we spoke with uh, Dan Straley. He used to pitch for the A's. He's now in the Korean baseball league. He talked about his experience as far as it's much different. Baseball players get to stay very early. I'm sure soccer players do too. You're already dressed. You're ready to go. So what are the protocols as far as when you guys can get there? Are you dressed, ready to go? And then maybe, you know, your post-game meal, stuff like that. Do you know what that's like or what the guidelines are revolving kind of a game day experience for you? Um, the game day experience, I, I'm not sure. I haven't experienced it yet. So uh, I'm still waiting to see exactly what that might look like. But as of right now, with the practice experience, uh, it's very similar to, to what – we've done in, in previous road trips. The, the main difference is that uh, there's other teams in the hotel with you. So there's other buses uh, mm -hmm. waiting to, to pick teams up. But besides that, and then the testing center, of course, like for example, today we woke up at uh, 6.45, um, walked over to the testing center around 7.20, got tested and then hopped on a bus um, to, to go to training. So that, that's been the experience so far. And the, the, the testing center that, that is set up is, is really well done. 
We haven't had any issues with waiting in line. I haven't seen any other teams in there while we've been in there. Um, so I think Major League Soccer's done a really good job of uh, protecting us from the virus. And uh, I, I'm, I'm still, like I said, optimistic about what's going to transpire here. So in essence, they've kind of created, let's say, a bubble within a bubble because your earthquakes team you just associate with the the guys on your team and staff members auxiliary staff it's not like you're going to hang out with the galaxy or like you're not all in a theater watching a movie or you everybody's kind of isolated within this larger bubble if is that an accurate description of what is taking place yeah, and, and I can't speak for any other teams, but our team's mindset is that, that we're, we're here to play soccer. We're, we're here to win this tournament. And so we're not too concerned about the, the social situation. Uh, we, we don't want to put our team at risk. So, so we're not interested in hanging out with other teams or, or speaking to players on different teams because it's clear that that would be adding risk to our situation. Um, because initially we didn't know about what happened in Dallas. So if some people had spent time with the Dallas players, that could be uh, a, a terrible situation for us. So we're focused on spending time with our team. We can control our own environment with the San Jose Earthquakes players. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're hanging out uh, with each other in our game room, um, but we're, we're not too concerned about meeting up with our friends across the league. Uh, because this isn't something uh, that was created for us to, to, to be social and catch up with old friends. I mean, it's, it's something that was created for us to allow us to have an environment that we can compete in. I mean, that, that's our job. That's what we do best. And so that's what we're here for. And that's the mentality I have. And that's the mentality that earthquakes have. And I, I hope other teams will do the same um, because I think that's, puts MLS in the best situation to have the best on-field product as well as have this tournament at all. You sound so old school. I like hearing that, you know, because nowadays everybody's, they got the same agents and the marketing deals and everybody's all huggy huggy after the games so in every sport. That's just the way it is. You're like, we're here to win this thing. I don't care about going to the movies with some guy. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> um, do you, I mean, if you take the, the kind of the 30,000 foot global view of this whole scenario, this is the ultimate grand human experiment that you're a part of and, and having this play out day after day and just seeing what you, because nobody has any idea really of what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's history. You know, this is history here in Orlando. This is the, the professional sports world's response to a pandemic. And it's an unprecedented situation that we've never seen before. Um, and it's, it's crazy to think about. But right now, we're, like I said earlier, we're, we're, we're living in a global crisis. And uh, it's an imperfect world. So yeah, maybe the, the food sometimes isn't perfect. Um, maybe it's not ideal that we can't go home and see our families before we play a game, but it's a sacrifice that I signed up for and I'm willing to take because I'm a pro soccer player and I want to do uh, what I do best. And I, I think the league did a great job of creating an environment for that. And I think that's the future of sports in these types of situations. Um, and to me so far, it seems like a great solution to a very complicated problem. And so I'm happy to be here. And uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I can't wait for our first game against Seattle. So I, I know you don't want to bash the situation, but I saw some posts about the box lunches. What's the deal with the, the box lunches look uh, sketchy? I'll just put it that way. Yeah, I saw all kinds of uh, people talking about that on Twitter last night. And that's what's so funny about social media these days is sometimes just one picture, it just doesn't tell the whole story. And uh, so the story behind the boxes is that, at least for our team, I can't speak for any other team, but for our team, when we arrived, 
uh, we had to do a self-quarantine process j just to ensure, like the situation with Dallas, that none of us would show up uh, positive upon arrival. So we, we were put in self-quarantine until we got those initial tests back, which to me sounds like a good idea. And so while we're in self-quarantine, we have to get our meals in our rooms. So they sent us uh, a box dinner. And so we, we received it. Um, and it was, a, it was steak with rice and beans. And it was actually really good. It was actually really good. Uh, it came in that same type of box. But when I opened it, I was pleasantly surprised. I'm like, wow, this looks like a good dinner. So we had that for dinner. And then the next morning, we woke up and did the same thing for breakfast. And the breakfast was, was, was good as well. I think the, the lunch was where the sandwich came in. And yeah, maybe it wasn't uh, the best sandwich whoever posted that had, but that wasn't the, the eating situation here. That was just for the first day in that self quarantine with room service. And the two meals that I had were totally fine. Okay. Um, and after that, now we have a full team buffet. And so it's, it's a situation that you get on every road trip as an MLS player. And uh, so when I saw that, I, I, was, I was laughing to myself because I'm like coming off of a full dinner plate where you can get first, seconds, thirds of like chicken, salmon, rice, beans. I mean, you name it. It's all there for you. And uh, sure enough, there's an there's a image of someone making – this hotel looked like the fire festival. I'm like, ah, that's not, that's not really, that's not really what's happening over here. Oh, that's, that is so funny. Cause that's exactly what everybody was posting. I mean, the sandwiches look, but, if, but if that's the anomaly, I mean, your buffet situation sounds fantastic. Yeah. So there's one day where you have to self quarantine as a team until you get the, that initial gotcha. uh, test back upon arrival. And all we had was, was dinner because we were the first team here. All we had was, was dinner and breakfast. And then we had our test results back. So we never had the, the, the lunch uh, where the, the sandwich, the infamous sandwich came in. But um, <laughs> you didn't hear any complaints from our team. But I mean, I'm sure opinions vary across the league. But for me, I think the food situation is fine. And it's, it's, it's not perfect, but... I mean, we're, we're not living in a, in a perfect world right now. Sure. Yeah, I want to take it back to the, kind of the historical context of this, but spin in a different direction. You know, we're living through the coronavirus times. But we're also living through the social unrest right now. And I saw on the Earthquakes Twitter account, you guys posted a photo taking a knee, putting your fists up. So, I mean, what led to that photo and how behind that message are you guys as a unit? Yeah, so uh, one of our players... Um, spoke out uh, right when uh, the protests began uh, to, 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 to occur. And he, he said it, he, he sent his message really well. And that was something that we all wanted uh, to get behind. And so we spoke about it as a team and we're thinking about different things that we can do. And uh, it's, it's, it's not easy uh, to, to, to organize things here here in Florida. So we don't have all the resources that we'd have in San Jose, but that was something that we came up with uh, to, to send a message to make sure that the world knows that, that, that we are behind um, the, the movement and the, the Black Lives Matter movement and that we're behind um, the equal treatment of all people. You know, we got players from all different countries on our team speaking all different types of languages. And that's something for me, I'm very grateful to have experienced because it's a message that I think is so well understood um, in locker rooms across the league, just because of the d diversity that we have. So after you spend two or three years in MLS, you really get a clear understanding of, of what it's like to speak to someone that doesn't speak English, say they're from South America. And then you get a clear understanding of what it's like speaking to players from Africa or Europe. I mean, there's guys from everywhere. And so I think it, ge it gives you a great perspective that not all people get, um, especially in the United States, where a lot of people never even leave the United States or, or live in certain neighborhoods where um, there isn't a ton of diversity. So it's something that we wanted to communicate and we wanted to make sure that that player, Jacob, um, knew that he was supported. 
and uh, we're, we're still talking about different things that, that we can do uh, to, to communicate our support for um, what's been going on. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can come up with. Uh, speaking of other languages, I know that you made it a goal of yours to really learn Spanish. And I saw in a recent press release when you guys first arrived, they'd, they'd labeled you as a bilingual speaker. So I guess you've pulled it off. Is there a is there like a favorite non-cursed Spanish word, like uh, biblioteca or something that you like to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny. That's why I'm still figuring it out. Uh, I always ask the guys on my team, because they say all kinds of words to each other. And I pick up on those words. And then I, I ask them, like, hey, so can I say this word like on social media or is this, is this something that like you're not allowed to say? Cause I don't know. They all, they always say it to each other all the time. Uh, the one that they did say was okay was Baludo, which is, which is probably one of my favorite uh, Argentinian words, which is just like, it's slang. Uh, and it's, it's a word that's said uh, amongst friends. So that's something you'll hear from all of the, the, the Argentinian guys on our team. Uh, which is which is funny, but yeah, no, I I learned Spanish basically. I studied over 400 hours um, last year to really put that first four for that first foot forward uh, for our team and um, try to show our team and the whole soccer community that if you really give it a shot, um, you you can do it. And so I wanted to inspire all the Spanish speakers on our team to learn English or at least try to learn English. English and then all of the English speakers on our team uh, to try to learn Spanish. So that, that was my goal. Wow. Tommy, I'm actually watching in the background of my TV. There's some soccer on ESPN across the world. And obviously you guys are going to be the next league to do it. Have you watched a lot of soccer getting ready? And what have you thought about, you know, no one's playing in front of fans. So you guys are have that too. What have you thought about that experience and, and what it's going to be like once you guys take the field in Seattle? Yeah, so it, it was it was bizarre for us to see, uh, you know, like the, the Bundesliga start up, especially when the negotiations were ongoing between our league and our players association. Uh, soccer just felt so far away for us. And I remember watching some of those games in uh, my apartment with some of my teammates because uh, we're roommates. Uh, I room with some of the guys on the team and uh, – it was, a, it was a weird feeling, like seeing other pro soccer players across the world getting back to the field, but then you don't know if you'll even be playing until November. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was bizarre. And every situation in every country is different and continues to be different. Um, so it, it, was, it was tough, but now it, it just makes it all the more exciting that we are one of the leagues with the plan to return. And uh, so that's something that I'm very grateful for. And in regard to the 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 games without fans, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people outside of the pro soccer community don't realize how we are actually quite accustomed to that situation. Like for example, when I played in the under twenty World Cup in New Zealand, um, some of those games were in empty stadiums as well. So you grow up playing in stadiums that don't have fans in them. Or for example, in preseason last year, we flew down to LA and played the uh, LAFC team in their own stadium without any fans because it's closed door. So it's something that, that, that we've experienced quite a lot. So I, I, it's not something that I think is going to bother me. Um, and it's actually going to be nice to be able to communicate with your teammates a lot easier because playing in stadiums like uh, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, you can't hear anything. Well, Seattle too, right? Yeah, yeah Seattle, Portland, all of those. Probably got to watch your mouth a little bit though, huh? Because the microphone's going to pick you guys up. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that. I got well, your just, back. I got your back. Uh, say whatever you're going to say in Spanish. And uh, <laughs> there's a chance that uh, people may not understand it. So, so are, you, are you conversant? Like, I mean, because your head coach speaks Spanish. So, I mean, it, it, it makes sense that you would uh, take the extra effort. But um, because, like, I, I, I speak broken Spanish. Uh, and so, you know, like, if we go wherever, let's say, you know, to Mexico, what the situation I always run into is I'll 
start talking to somebody, let's say this was pre-pandemic, you know, at a restaurant and, you know, trying to help with my family's order. And then they assume, oh, you can actually talk. And then it's too fast. Slow down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a situation that, that can definitely happen, especially without context. Understanding uh, those interactions can be difficult. But for me, I, I wouldn't say I'm perfectly fluent, but I think the best example I can give is uh, our head coach actually asked me to do an Instagram Live um, about just about two months ago. In Espanol? Yeah, in Spanish. In Spanish. And, and we did the Instagram Live for – um, over 50 minutes. So, so just about, just about an hour wow. and it was almost all in Spanish. Um, he actually wrote down some questions in English. So he asked me some questions in English cause he's studying English right now and he's working on it. Um, but the rest of it was in Spanish and I, I was very comfortable, uh, communicating what I needed to communicate. But of course there was, there was context. Uh, I, I knew what we were talking about. So, it, it was it was easier for me, um, but I would say I, I'm more than conversational. But when it comes to the slang from Mexico, Argentina, Peru, and I'm hearing it uh, just like one sentence at a time from each player in the locker room, that's where it's almost the the most difficult to to understand. So that's what I'm working towards the to really start to get each dialect down. That's um, hard. But yeah, it's it's really difficult. But as of right now. I can just about communicate anything uh, I'd like to communicate, uh, which, is, which has been a huge step forward for me because I've been playing with guys from Central South America my whole career, and I've never been able to, to speak Spanish to them. So to now be able to, to bridge that gap um, at times in our locker room has been an amazing experience. I know we got to wrap up here really soon. Um, have you had any chance to talk with Wando? Uh, on this trip because obviously Chris Wondolowski, I mean, he is Mr. San Jose earthquake, uh, grew up in Danville. And I'm just wondering, this is supposed to be his final season. He has said that he's away from his family. He's got a couple of kids, you know, his wife, all that. And the strain and knowing that this is supposed to be your final year and to go out in this manner, I'm hoping he comes back for one more if we have a regular season next year, but uh, any conversations? Yeah, I, I think he, he had an interview over the, the quarantine period where he, he said the, the door to return is, it, it, is closed, but it's unlocked. So I don't know what exactly <laughs> that meant. Um, and I haven't talked to him about it. Normally, he's my roommate on road trips. So uh, we, we have conversations about all kinds of stuff. But uh, – I think we, Matias is our, our head coach has been working us so hard that guys have been too tired to really spend too much time with each other. So I haven't had a ton of conversations with him, uh, especially about that. Uh, but he, he looks great in training. Um, it's amazing how much of an engine he still has. We were just doing an exercise today where we had to man mark each other in like a six V six scrimmage. And the fact that he could still run around, and be difficult to mark at 36 years old. And, you know, I'm, I'm 24 years old, uh, still uh, being pushed to try to keep up with him. I mean, it's a testament to the athlete he is and the competitive spirit that, that, that he still has got, which is, uh, which, is a, which is a huge positive influence for, for our team. So I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I will say that he's looking good in training. Cool. Now, it's kind of crazy. We've gone like 30 minutes. We haven't even talked to you about the videos you made. And we, you know, we checked in with you earlier about the videos. And I mean, how much further has it gone? And I know you and I have exchanged some brief tweets just about the editing skills and that you've picked that up too, in addition to speaking <laughs> Spanish. So what has this experience been like for you? How rewarding has it been to kind of take a bad situation in this, this pandemic outbreak and really turn it into something positive, which you really did? Yeah, so it started when the NBA shut down. Um, that was where I saw the writing on the wall that, uh, you know, our league was probably going to shut down very soon after that. And so once um, that took place, my, my dad called me right away and he, he runs a soccer club up in Sacramento. 
And he says, hey, Tommy, uh, a lot of kids are going to be away from their teams for potentially a really long time. Like, uh, what do you think we can do to, to help out? And we, so we spoke about it for uh, a couple minutes. And what we landed on was uh, what we call a trick of the day. Uh, that's what our family calls it. Because uh, we, we, he, my dad ran soccer camps for, for years as well. And he'd always start off each camp by having a trick of the day to challenge each kid at the camp. Like, if you can learn how to do this soccer trick, then you'll win, um, you know, a pizza or like a Pepsi or something small like that. So we're like, okay, what we should do is uh, post different uh, skills challenges on my Instagram, my Twitter, and challenge kids across the, the world in quarantine uh, two different tricks of the day. And the, the tweet got over 100,000 views within like 24 hours. And so immediately we were like, yeah, the, the kids need this right now. And uh, the trick of the day was, was somewhat of a fad that would catch kids' attention. Um, but it, it wasn't something that, that could really get them doing something consistently. So after that, and we, I, I, once we saw the attention that that had gotten, we're like, okay, what else can we do? And that's where we landed on the, uh, the YouTube channel. And so we uploaded over 150 different videos of me demonstrating all the different dribbling exercises that I did as a kid that helped me become a pro soccer player. Because I'm not the biggest player, the strongest player. You know, I'm just 5'7". Um, and I've played as a forward, a midfielder, and a defender. And so that's something that we wanted to communicate to all the kids, that regardless of their position, if you work on these skills, um, you could come out of quarantine a much better player than you were going into it. And it, it was amazing. You know, it's gotten over like 230,000 views now um, across the channel. But the coolest part about it is that the YouTube channel then progressed into actual live Zoom training sessions to where I would host um, a, a session for, say, I, I hosted a session for Walnut Creek. And then 250 kids logged into their computer and they made my screen big so they could see me. And then I would coach them um, almost like we're doing a one-on-one -on -one session, but it's just with 250 kids at the time. So those Zoom practice sessions uh, were, were something that I never thought would be possible. And within the last month, I had done over 40 of them. Um, so it, it was really cool. And it was in like nine different states as well over 2000 kids total um, that we've been able to reach. So it was a lot of fun just trying to turn a negative situation into a positive one. And the feedbacks I, I, I've gotten has, has kept me going. So it's, it's, it's cool to see kids improving and that, that's what we set out to do. Tommy, I'm going through your Twitter feed and it kind of fits just what we were talking about. There's a t-shirt you're wearing and someone asked you, it says priorities, one impact people and two play soccer. You said you made that shirt, and uh, are they available for retail? <laughs> yeah, not not yet. I made that shirt uh, two years ago, before I really had made as big of an impact as I've had over the past uh, couple months. It was always my goal. Um, like Ever since I signed with the Earthquakes, the first thing I, I told myself was that, okay, do everything you can to make an impact on the field and then do everything you can to make an impact off the field as well. And th that was my goal from the get-go. Um, but it's not easy. You can't just wake up one morning and be like, oh, like go inspire thousands of kids across the U.S. <laughs> um, you have to figure out a real plan, and it takes a lot of effort. And so over the, the course of the past, you know, six and a half years, I I've been doing a lot of coaching, and it's prepared me uh, to actually create this platform of, of, of online coaching in quarantine. And it's something that I, I didn't make any money off of. I just wanted to help um, all the kids in the Bay Area and across the United States as well to stay motivated. And ironically enough, it kept me motivated as well. I mean, there's times where I'd be showing the kids the skills that I was doing. And I'd be like, all right, you just spent all day coaching kids. Like now you actually have to go put your money where your mouth is and go train on your own like you tell them you do. So it, it was good. It ended up keeping me motivated as well. So it's, it's funny how, how things work like that sometimes. Awesome. Well, last night I was watching some of your videos and uh, I, I came across the, uh, the Ronaldo, uh, the, the, the kind of the switchback. And I, I looked at it in, in, you know, real time. And I was like, 
wait a second, how did he do that? Man, I wish you would slow-mo it. And then like five seconds later, you cut to the slow-mo. I mean, I'm like, oh, that's how it, this is, it was so good. I mean, you're, the videos are really, really good. So. Yeah, exactly. It's a, there, that's what I wanted to, to provide for the kids because it's, it's really the same stuff that I did. And I know it's not always the most fun, but a lot of times some of the most important things aren't the most fun things to do. Um, so I wanted to give them just a one-stop shop of a full quarantine soccer curriculum where they can continue improving despite not having uh, their coach in person, despite not having their, their teammates around them. Well, I, I'm going to start practicing your videos if there's a really an ancient man's soccer league. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to be really, really good. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to do one trick. I'll be able to do one move, maybe. Uh, that's okay. about it, though. Uh, thanks so much for your time. I mean, this has been awesome. Uh, you're so gracious with your time and uh, just to give us life inside the bubble. I'm not sure you realize it, but the, you know, the name of the podcast is With Authority. So before we leave you, we got to get a Corner Tony Dodd. Uh, right? <laughs> I mean, that's you got to give us some Espanol. <laughs> can make it as a city. Wait, what do you want? What do you want me to say? <laughs> With authority. No, no, no it didn't be as a, as a blab. Like, I didn't understand that word. <laughs> No, it, Con is with an authority, authority dad. Oh, I feel like that. Ah, oh, see, Con is with that. Are you sure you took Spanish lessons? Wait a second here. We need to edit this out. I'm not. Yeah, estaba perdido un poquito. I was lost a little bit with that. Like, there's a poquito diferente, but está bien. No importa. Lo más importante es que estamos intentando. It's just like, the most important thing is that we're trying. You know, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but you're not understanding me, so maybe it's my problem, but... <laughs> Well, I'm so glad we did that to end with that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much for being on our With Authority podcast. Oh, uh, perfect, perfect. Despacio. See, Despacio. See, see, let them end it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Stay safe in Orlando, okay? Right, and, uh, we look forward to catching up with you again. Thanks, Tommy. With Authority.